one uh, of the most uh, wonderful resources uh, that God has given us uh, is the resource of prayer. And uh, one of the things uh, in 2020 uh, that uh, I can say that God has uh, deepened in my own personal life uh, is my prayer life. Uh, at its uh, basic, uh, prayer means total dependence upon God. Depending totally upon God is what prayer is all about. Uh, and, and the simplest definition is uh, prayer is talking to the Lord. Actually, it's a two-way communication, listening to God and then responding to God. So as we uh, begin a new year, uh, I want to uh, refresh your memories from the Bible on 10 prayers that you and I would do well to pray personally, as a family, and as a church. And all these uh, 10 prayers that we are going to look at uh, begin with the letter G. And uh, the notes are av available for you on the chat. And if you uh, want it later, you can always uh, email us and we can send it to you. Uh, so let's begin. <clears throat> Number one, the first prayer that you and I need to pray, grace me. Lord, grace me. And the scripture I would like to use is uh, Titus 2, 11 to 13. And uh, it talks about the grace of God. And uh, praise God. It says that God's grace has appeared in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and has provided salvation to all people. I like that word all. No one is excluded. And uh, you are included in that word all. Uh, God's uh, touch of salvation is available to you and to me. Now, once we experience God's grace in salvation, the forgiveness of sins, uh, the gift of eternal life, a right relationship with God because of what the Lord Jesus did for us at the cross, his death and resurrection. It secures our salvation. Now, it's the second part that is not stressed uh, too much uh, in Christian circles. So if this grace is operational in our life, what will it do? <laughs> So it says, it teaches us, some translations say it trains us. So grace is a great teacher. When you invoke the grace of God into your life, it teaches you. What does grace teach you? It teaches you to renounce, or as some translations say, to say no, a big loud no, to ungodly living, and worldly passions. Isn't that our biggest challenge? Ungodly living and worldly passions. The grace of God teaches us day by day to say no to sin so that we might live sensible, honest, and godly lives. Again, I like the use of those three words. Sensible, honest, and godly lives in this present age. The grace of God teaches us to live a life of integrity. No duplicity, no hypocrisy. What you see is what you get. No skeletons hidden in the closet. And this grace continues to teach us day by day as we eagerly await the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to take us home to himself. So in this new year, I want to encourage you, as I encourage myself, to pray and say, God, grace my life. God, may grace be a teacher. And may grace enable me to say no to all the sinful tendencies that come up in my life so that I can embrace all that is holy and good and noble and righteous. And that's the best way, Lord, I can prepare myself for your soon return. Lord, 
grace me. Now the second prayer that uh, I want you and me to pray is the prayer, Lord, guide me. Lord, guide me. And there are two scriptures we are going to bring up on the screen for you. These are great scriptures on the subject of guidance. And uh, there are four words that we are going to underline, and you would do well to underline in your Bible. Psalm 25 and verse 4, show me your ways, Lord. So I would like show me to be underlined. Show me. And then it says, teach me your paths. Teach me. Show me. Teach me. And then as we keep reading, it says, guide me or lead me. So underline lead me. Lead me in your truth and teach me. The second time in two verses, you have that uh, expression, teach me. For you are God, my savior. Isn't that beautiful? That was what the first prayer was all about, for God to be our savior. And my hope is in you all day long. So what is this prayer of guidance? It is asking God to show me, to teach me, to lead me in his ways, to guide me according to his plan for my life. Yes, we don't know what the new year holds for any one of us, but I'm sure deep down in our hearts, we all want to fit into God's plan for our life. We don't want to settle for plan B. We want plan A to be operational in our lives. And one of the ways that plan is set in motion in your life and my life is when we look to the Lord in prayer. And these are very simple prayers, nothing complicated. Show me, lead me, teach me how to walk in your path, O Lord. May I not get detoured. May I not get distracted. May I not go down rabbit trails. May I walk in the path of righteousness. Now look at the next verse, Psalm 32, verse 8. Again, another great verse on uh, guidance. I will instruct you. So underline the words instruct you. We are asking God to be our teacher and teach you. So there again, teach you. Please underline teach you. That's the third time you have the word teach in the two verses that we have looked at. We take a very humble position. We don't know. We are ignorant. We are foolish. And we are asking God himself to be our teacher to be our instructor. And then it says, here is another phrase I want underline. God says, I will counsel you. So underline counsel you. I will counsel you with my loving eye upon you. God is watchful over us. And uh, God knows that we are prone to wander. We are wavered sheep. And with his eye upon us, he is going to advise us and counsel us to walk on his path. Let me put all those words together for you again. Show me, teach me, lead me, instruct me, counsel me. Just take those scriptures and personalize it in prayer for your life and for the lives of your loved ones. Lord, grace me. Lord, guide me. Now we come to prayer number three. Lord, guard me. Lord, guard me. We live in a very dangerous world. 
COVID has taught us that in 2020. Dangerous world. And we need protection. So let's uh, look at uh, these verses. Psalm 32 and verse 7. We looked at verse 8 a moment ago. Now we are looking at verse 7. You are my hiding place. In times like these, we need a hiding place. A place that we can run into and be safe. And that hiding place is the person of God himself. Run into the arms of God and be safe and secure. You will protect me, so please underline protect me. That's this prayer. You will protect me from what? Trouble. You are going to protect me from trouble. Name the trouble, whatever the trouble is. It could be an invisible virus. It could be visible dangers. Protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Deliverance. When we are asking God to guard us, we are asking God to deliver us from dangers seen and unseen. The Lord is our hiding place. And then we look at Psalm 91. <laughs> How could we talk about protection and not make any reference to Psalm 91? So we are looking at verse 14, Psalm 91 and verse 14. Because he loves me, says the Lord, that's you and me. If we are in a love relationship with the Lord, I will rescue him. Isn't that beautiful? God will rescue us. God will deliver us. I will protect him. Explicitly it's stated there that God takes the responsibility to protect us for he acknowledges my name. Because you acknowledge the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because you have pledged allegiance to the name of Christ, God takes responsibility for your protection. Psalm 91, verse 14. And then, of course, the Lord's Prayer, one singular statement uh, that is so powerful in the Lord's Prayer, where we pray in Matthew 6.13, deliver us from the evil one. Don't lead us into a place where we will be tempted and cave into sin but deliver us from the evil one. Now, that could be taken to mean two things. Deliver us from the evil one is a reference to Satan, right? God, please protect us, guard us from all satanic attack and traps, the wiles of the evil one. But it can also mean deliver us from evil generally speaking. And there is so much of evil all around us, right? Moral evil, physical evil. And we are humbly praying, God, deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from all evil. The prayer for protection. I want to introduce you to St. Patrick's breastplate Prayer of protection. Uh, when I came across this uh, uh, prayer uh, a few years ago, uh, I was really, really, really struck by it. And uh, I took a printout and uh, I have tried to pray it from time to time. And uh, as you and I enter into a new year, I want you to get a printout of this prayer. You can actually uh, find it on Google. And it's a pretty lengthy prayer, but uh, for our purposes, I have, uh, I'm just going to read four stanzas. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, 
Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. Now watch the third stanza. I would encourage you to memorize it. I bind unto myself the name, the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three. Did you see what uh, St. Patrick is praying? He is binding himself to the triune God and asking the triune God to protect him, to defend him. Of whom all nature hath creation, eternal Father, Spirit, Word, praise to the Lord of my salvation. Salvation is of Christ, the Lord. So prayer number three is the prayer for protection. Lord, guard me. Now we come to prayer number four. And you might uh, think this to be a pretty strange prayer, and it is, but it's in the Bible. Lord, grieve me. That's prayer number four. Lord, grieve me. That's another way of saying, Lord, give me tears. Give me tears. Now, there are at least two main reasons why you and I should pray for a broken heart. This is a prayer for brokenness. And let's look at the first reason where the psalmist prays in Psalm 119 and verse 136. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not to be. Can you see why the psalmist is crying? He's shedding copious tears. Why? Because he lost his job? Because of a pandemic? Uh, no. The reason he is crying is because as he looks around, he sees people who should know better, who are willfully, deliberately, intentionally disobeying the word of God. You find them in every local church. People who have the Bible in their hand, people who listen to messages, and yet sadly, just go ahead and do their own thing. And the psalmist surveyed the situation of his day, and he was so brokenhearted. Nothing grieves a pastor more than when he sees his beloved sheep willfully disobeying the word of God. And so may God give all of us tears to weep over our own personal disobedience and then to weep over the disobedience that we see all around us among people who profess to be the children of God. Now, here is a second reason why you, you and I should have tears. And we look at this from Romans 9 and verse 2. And Romans 9 verse 2, Paul says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul was a broken-hearted man. He always had great sorrow in his heart. Unceasing anguish. Never a moment when his heart was free of anguish. And you and I may ask, why? Why is Paul so brokenhearted? You know why? If you read the whole chapter, Romans 9, he is so broken over his people who have not trusted Christ for salvation. You know, as you and I look at our family circle, as you and I look at our relatives, our friends, there are quite a number who don't know the Lord. And with each passing day, 
time is running out. With each passing day, the heart gets more hard and stubborn and set in its ways. And this is where we are asking God to give us tears to pray for the salvation of our loved ones. Can I say it lovingly, but can I also say it firmly? If our loved ones, our relatives, our friends, our work colleagues, our neighbors die without Christ, it's the final goodbye. It's the final goodbye. We do all what we can while they are alive to pray for their salvation. May 2021 find us more on our knees, shedding copious tears, crying out to the Lord for the salvation of our loved ones. They may be prospering. They may be climbing the social ladder, the career ladder. But then to make this horrible discovery that this ladder that they are climbing is a very wobbly ladder leaning on the wrong wall. Without Christ, there is absolutely no hope. Without Christ, death is final. So, beloved, I want to encourage you to ask the Lord to grieve you, to pain you, that there will be unceasing anguish in your heart for, the, for those who are lost, who are outside the fold. And they may be as close as a family member, a spouse, a child, a parent, a sibling. Cry your heart out for their salvation. To pray with tears is to make an eternal investment. To pray with tears is to sow your tears with eternal harvest. No tear shed in burdened intercession for others is ever forgotten by God, unrecorded or in vain. Intercession watered with your tears is one of the most powerful forms of prayer known. As surely as God is in heaven, the Bible says, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Psalm 126. Now that brings us to exactly the opposite. The fifth prayer that you and I need to pray Lord, gladden me. Lord, gladden me. Lord, make me a person of joy, supernatural joy. And so the passage that was read to us, Psalm 90 and verse 15. <clears throat> we, we, we love verse 12. Many sermons would be preached tonight and tomorrow and Sunday on Psalm 90 and verse 12. But look at verse 15. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. We have seen a plenty of trouble in 2020, some of us much more than others. And here we are praying that God will recompense us for the sorrow, for the tears, for the pain, for the heartache with his joy that the Lord will flood our hearts with his joy. Psalm 30 and verse 5, a verse that has become very precious to me. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. <laughs> and I uh, said to myself, that night seems to be a very long night. Very long night. Uh, for me, that night has now lasted over nine months. That weeping has been for over nine months. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And Psalm 16, verse 11, again, one of my favorite verses. In your presence 
is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the presence of God is fullness of joy. So prayer number five is where we pray, Lord, gladden me. Fill my heart with joy, supernatural joy, the joy of the Lord. May that be our portion every single day in this coming new year. Our circumstances could still be very depressing and they could still be very negative. But God can plant his joy in our heart. Now, prayer number six <laughs> is the most favorite prayer of the average Christian. This is what I call the grocery list prayer. So prayer number six is give me. Most of our prayers are punctuated with this expression, give me, give me, give me, give me. Now, nothing wrong with a grocery list, but only thing is don't make that as number one. You will find that if you pray the other prayers, your grocery list will become shorter and shorter. So Matthew 6, 11, in the Lord's Prayer, I mean, how can we forget this? Give us this day our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. And that's a very appropriate prayer. Lord, today, please provide me with the basic necessities of life. Daily bread. Bread is the most staple food in many cultures even today. And without bread, you just can't survive physically. So here we are praying, God, give us the basic necessities of life. And that includes a job. And often in our prayer meetings, we pray for those without jobs. Because without an income, how could you make ends meet? And the Lord wants us to work and earn a living to support ourselves, to support others, to support the work of God. So we can pray this prayer. Give us today, this next 24 hours, Lord, please supply our basic necessities. But uh, I want to uh, take it one step higher. And I love the way Solomon prayed when uh, he became king. And it's recorded for us in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9, where Solomon prayed, give. So there you have that word give. Give your servant. Can you see how humble uh, Solomon is? He calls himself a servant of the Lord. Give your servant a discerning heart. How would you like to pray that for this coming new year? God, give me a discerning heart. And then he uh, proceeds to explain what this discernment is all about. To distinguish between right and wrong. Uh, the lines are blurred today, isn't it? The right and wrong. Lines are so blurred. And uh, we uh, step very easily uh, into uh, uncharted territory. So, we pray, Lord, give me a discerning heart to distinguish between right and wrong, error and truth. I personally uh, think this is one of the most important uh, missing uh, components uh, in the church of today. The lack of discernment. So, pray like Solomon for a discerning heart. <laughs> and you know what happened? When Solomon prayed for a discerning heart, the Lord was able to give him success, wealth, popularity, prosperity, because Solomon's heart was in the right place. So if our heart is in the right place with God, then God can entrust us with uh, whatever wealth he chooses to give us because he knows that we are going to use it responsibly. So prayer number six is, give me. Now we come to prayer number seven, and prayer number seven is, Lord, gratify me. Lord, gratify me. The alternate word for this is, satisfy me. 
I didn't want to lose my alliteration. So that's why I use this word gratify me. And again, we go to Psalm 90. And again, this verse that we often overlook. And what a verse this is. I love this verse. Psalm 90 and verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. First thing in the morning, Lord, I want to be totally satisfied with your unfailing love. I want to taste your love all over again. I want a fresh experience of your love. Please don't live a stale Christianity. None of us like stale bread. None of us like stale food. And we should uh, <clears throat> hate stale Christianity. And this prayer is all about God's love becoming more real in our life every day. In the morning, satisfy us with your unfailing love. Now see what the result is going to be. That we may, uh, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. The earlier prayer that we prayed was that, isn't it? Lord, gladden me. And here is the answer or the secret to that prayer. When we are totally satisfied with the love of God, we are going to be joyful and glad all our days. We may not have too much of this world's material goods, but if we are experiencing God's love in fresh new ways, we will be totally satisfied, totally content, and we will be joyful and glad all our days. Again, we go to Psalm 91, the psalm that we love, and look at verse 16, where God says, with long life, I will satisfy him. So there you have it. God wants to satisfy us with long life. Now, by long life here, it is not just only in terms of length of life, but more importantly, quality of life. What's the point living a long life if there is no quality of life? And we are praying, Lord, satisfy me with a high quality of life, your very life in my soul. Your very life in my soul. Long life. And I will show him my salvation. Deliverance. So Lord, gratify me. Now we come to prayer number eight. Lord, glue me. Lord, glue me. Uh, I wanted to use the word super glue me. But my alliteration will go, so uh, let's use Lord glue me. Now, there are two areas where we need to be glued. Genesis 2.24, a man will leave his father and mother and be united or be glued to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Super glued to your wife. That's what marriage is all about. And how sad when marriages end in divorce. That which was meant to be super glued has got unglued. And every time there is a divorce, no one wins. You take heavy duty. And so we pray, Lord, super glue our marriages. You may be married for five years, 10 years, 20 years. But those marriages need to be constantly glued together. What a relevant prayer for the new year. Strong marriages, strong families. We are asking God to glue us. But not only within the biological family, look at Romans 12.10. Romans 12.10 says, be devoted. And within bracket, I would put, be glued. Be glued to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. 
Now, this is the family of God. In the family of God, we need to be glued to each other. Yes, there will be conflict. Yes, there will be disagreements. But there should be no separation. Right? We should be glued to one another. Satan will do all what he can to divide us. Satan will do all what he can to rip us apart, to bring confusion. And we must not give him room to do so. So in our prayer meetings, very often, there are those who pray for the unity of the church. And that's very important. Harmony in the church. And that happens when we are super glued to each other. Lord, glue me. Now we come to prayer number nine. And prayer number nine is, Lord, ground me. <laughs> Today, because of the pandemic, we are grounded. <laughs> uh, somebody asked me, uh, uh, can you go to this place and pick up this thing? I said, no, I can't. And they said, why? Because I said, I'm grounded. I don't have a vehicle. My vehicle is gone. Now, that's not the real meaning of uh, this ninth prayer. Ground me means to be grounded in the word of God. For our roots to go more deeply into the scriptures and into the God of the word. So, two verses, Colossians 3.16 let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That word dwell. The word dwell means to be at home. To be permanent. For the word of Christ, for the word of God, to be settled deep down in our hearts. For the word of God to have access to every part of our life. Okay, for the word of God not to be just a visitor but to be a permanent guest, having access to every part of our human psyche. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In other words, when you and I are grounded in the word of God, it's going to lead to a life of worship. All those uh, expressions, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, they are all part of our worship. You and I can't worship aright if the word of God is not dwelling in our hearts. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we have an exposition of the scriptures, that it will lead us to a life of worship. So actually, uh, prayer number nine, Lord, ground me can also be subtitled, Lord, make me a worshiper, authentic worshiper. Worship God in spirit and in truth. And truth there refers to objective truth, the scriptures. And then uh, Psalm 119, verse 11, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Why should we be grounded in the word of God? Why should we meditate and memorize the scriptures so that we will not sin against God. And that takes us to our very first prayer. Lord, grace me. Grace teaches us to say no to sin. And how do we learn to say no to sin? By being grounded in the scriptures. So will you make a commitment in uh, 2021 to be a man, a woman of the word of God, to spend more time in the scriptures, to read through the Bible, to take more time for the word of God, to journal, to pray scripture. And uh, as Spurgeon rightly said, if uh, someone were to cut you somewhere, you should be bleeding Bible because the word is very active in your life. Lord, ground me. Now we come to the final prayer. <laughs> and this is a very intriguing prayer. Lord, goad me. Now, some of you may not have heard this word before. Lord, goad me. The goad is an instrument used by plowmen for guiding their oxen. The goad is a formidable weapon. It is sometimes 10 feet long, and it has a very sharp point. 
I certainly don't want to be an ox at the receiving end of a goat. Because when the ox refuses to move, what does the farmer do? He jabs it with the goat. The ox feels the pain and gets to work. And it is said of Shemgar that he slew 600 Philistines with an ox goat. Makes a lot of sense if uh, this is what uh, uh, the goat is all about, right? And uh, that's Judges 3.31. Now in Acts 9.5, a very interesting uh, expression occurs when uh, Paul gets converted on the Damascus road. Remember, he's thrown off his high horse and he hears the voice of the Lord himself. And when Saul said, Lord, who are you? The response, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads, the goads of conviction. Don't kick it. You'll only hurt yourself more. Just imagine an ox kicking at the goad. <laughs> uh, it, it, it'll hurt itself uh, much more terribly. And uh, Saul was fighting conviction. He was trying to resist God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and the beautiful picture in Deuteronomy 32, 11 of a mother eagle, when it builds its nest, it puts a lot of twigs and thorns and covers it with moss and grass. And when the eaglets are born, initially there is a lot of comfort. But then the time comes where the eaglets have to learn to fly. And you know what the mother uh, eagle does? It removes the grass, it removes the moss. And the eaglets feel the prick of the thorns, the goads. And uh, they climb out of the nest. <laughs> and that's how they learn to fly. And as they fall, the mother comes and holds them in a, on her pinions. What a beautiful picture of where God wants to move us out of our comfort zone. Now, if you are not very comfortable with this word goad, I would like you to uh, rephrase it, Lord, prick me. Lord, prick me in 2021. I'm far too comfortable. Or if you want to use another word, Lord, disturb me. Lord, disturb me. Move me out of my comfort zone, into the combat zone. Lord, I don't want to be a spectator. Lord, I want to become active for you. Lord, goad me. God can use circumstances to goad you. God can use his word to goad you. God can use a sermon to goad you. God can use a fellow brother, sister to goad you. God can use an unbeliever to goad you. God has so many different ways of uh, goading you. But we all need to feel the prick of the goad in 2021 so that we can become more effective for our Lord. So these are the 10 prayers I want to encourage you to pray. Very simple prayers, nothing complicated, but pray them sincerely, honestly, personally, as families, as the church, and let's see what God is going to do in response to these prayers. And so let me pray. Thank you, Lord, that you teach us how to pray, and your word is so clear on what we should be praying for. And Lord, we take these 10 prayer requests and we want to personalize it. Lord, some of them look very, very difficult and we don't want it, humanly speaking, but we need it. And so we invite you, Lord, to come and do your work in each and every one of our hearts. We don't want to be the same. We want to be different, radically different. We want to be godly. We want to be honest, sensible. We want to make a big impact for you, Lord. And so teach us to pray. Teach us to pray these 10 prayers over and over again. Teach us to become familiar with these scriptures that we looked at. And so help us and bless us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.